thank you guys for being here with us on a Thursday evening and um, and joining us. I'm not going to say too much because I think what we wanted to do today was um, well, I met Harun literally about an hour ago <laughs> and and have only recently kind of encountered his practice. And I think also for for those of you um, who maybe have not seen uh, so much of the work, certainly this is this is great and new for the UAE, UAE having such a um, you know, a few different presentations of your work. What we wanted to do really was open it up and introduce the practice and maybe keep it quite free flowing today um, and meander through a number of different ideas. So we're gonna let, well, ask Harun to really present and kind of talk to us about a few different bodies of work. And then um, at some point I'll interrupt and we'll, we'll, we'll have a conversation and open it up to the floor. So um, that's what we're gonna do today. So over to you, Harun. Yes, um, thank you, Jyoti. Thank you, Sabi. Um, nice to see you all, uh, familiar faces and new faces. Um, yeah, so I thought because uh, probably uh, my work is relatively new to um, uh, a lot of people here, and you, you may have seen things, but they, uh, you know, they're quite different. The presentations up here and uh, in uh, NYU AD. Um, I just sort of go through it, do a quick overview uh, of the sort of basic principles and I'll just play this in the background so it's uh, scrolling through images it will stop at some point so this is probably a bunch of slides from between 2013 and 2000 this piece was actually shown at the Sharjah Biannual in 2013 I think it was um, uh, so you know I'm not uh, I'm uh, not new to the uh, to the region in, in that sense, but it's I've never really spent time here, as, as Sabi said. Um, but so, yeah, so I thought maybe a sort of a, a, a brief overview because I'm more interested in having a conversation and talking about things and talking to you guys than uh, talking about myself. Um, so, yeah, as Sabi said in his delightful introduction that my I work with electricity and um, it took me a while to kind of come to that realization, even though I was doing it. And I was, you know, I, I thought I was uh, using electronics to make music. I guess I was, I was, make, I was producing sounds and things from from hacking household objects and layering those sounds and uh, organizing in some way to sort of create these. Uh, auditory compositions uh, and it felt like quite a m musical practice but working with objects and uh, uh, and found objects and found materials that were sort of around me and artworks that's a these are these are artworks by other people so that's a film by Jeremy uh, sorry that was a there was a film by Jeremy Della and a, and a 16 millimeter film by Guy Sherwin so kind of it's like a curatorial practice but also uh, uh, a a sort of practice of composition, I'd like to call it composition in the sense that I'm composing with both visual and acoustic material simultaneously. But one of the sort of key things was working with electricity and, and, and radio uh, and sort of um, electromagnetism or things on the electromagnetic spectrum. Both electromagnetism in terms of light and uh, you know, electricity, but also um, sound, sound waves, um, and kind of manipulating those things and, and uh, working with it to, so to create form, right? So, and, and these were sort of playing out within space and time. Um, so, I, so I thought that the term composition sort of describes it best. Um, so a lot of these works, you see LED lighting. So just from a technical aspect, what uh, is like a device, I started building devices to kind of, um, to, do, uh, to do the kind of work I, was, I, was, I wanted to do, which was, which was making installations with light and sound. But the, the, but the signal, the electrical signal that I was composing with was both going directly to the, to the lights and, and to, into speakers, so you're hearing the electrical signal simultaneously to the, to the, uh, what you're seeing. Um, I guess it's something to do with the development of technology as well. So, for instance, um, LED lighting sort of became like, you know, it was sort of started to replace um, 
uh, halogen lighting as a more sort of efficient way of doing things. And we had this switch from using voltage to control lighting to using, uh, sorry to get a bit technical here, but using electron electronics to control lighting. So the way that we dimmed and brightened light was through an electronic process called pulse width modulation. And that process was um, sort of used fundamentally for, uh, or it was used for lots of things, but it was also one of the processes used in um, instruments and in synthesizers and electronic music. So we, we got to this point in our sort of technological development where we were using the same electronic process to change lighting, but also create sound. So it became like this uh, form that was uh, uh, something more synesthetic somehow, the reception of it. Um, so that grew and evolved and uh, takes up many different guises. And, you know, as any other person, I'm interested in lots of different things. You know, I'm interested in everything. Well, not everything, but most things. And we're, we're sort of influenced and, and angered and, and, you know, inspired by things that happen around us. So the subjects sort of really quite vary uh, in my work. Uh, sometimes overtly political and sometimes um, overtly uh, sort of non-political and, and more sort of phenomenological uh, and just maybe reduced to aesthetics and, and, um, and uh, yeah, sort of form, you know. Um, so I might just, so these, yeah, so these are mo mostly early works and this is a piece that was made in on a residency at the NCA in Lahore. And uh, well, it was kind of a assemblage made from various objects referring to like Sufi traditions and, and other, and, and, uh, and, and sort of music, how music is latent in, in, in Pakistani culture. Um, I don't want to, yeah, perhaps I shouldn't try and focus on particular works too much. Uh, because these slides are running too far, <laughs> too fast to kind of focus on them, uh, and perhaps talk about um, maybe more recent works just quickly. So it's um, so um, it's not too. Oh, I can't. Hang on, let's see here. So those slides will probably just go on. Let's see what's in this one. There's some more here. Okay, fine. All right, let's do this one for a bit. No. Is that going to work? Sorry about this. All right, that seems to be going. Um, okay, so this is a recent show that I just um, finished. At. I'm going to try and let's see if we can go back to the beginning of this. Uh, that just ended in London at uh, the Listen Gallery. And <clears throat> this sort of encompasses kind of most of the ideas that um, I'm thinking about right now. And um, it's, it's called, it's got a typographical title, which is just three straight lines, but it refers to um, 111 hertz. So a frequency that's found, uh, it, it's, it's a frequency that inspired me because it, I, I came across a paper that we were just discussing a minute ago and that I literally just airdropped to Chotti. <laughs> um, that, um, and it's kind of an unusual paper because you, you said you couldn't find any, any information about it, right? So it's not a very, it's not a very easily accessible paper. Mm. And it sort of, it was, um, it was um, partly about, it was partly archeological and partly neuroscientific, where the, the scientists were talking about how in Northwestern Europe, there's lots of caves and um, long barrows and um, basically Neolithic and Megalithic chambers that have been, discovered to have they been excavated or, or constructed to have a room resonance of 111 hertz. And it was just a curious thing. It was, all, it was always between 110 and 112. So, you know, taking the mean as 111. 
And, um, you know, so it was unknown why this would be. There was no sort of archaeological archaeological record to sort of uh, describe why the people were doing this. Um, and so more recently in the, in the sort of, uh, I think it was around 2007, 8, I, I might get this wrong, but um, uh, the timing that is, uh, there was a study done by some scientists at Harvard and somewhere else, and they were basically exposing light and sound to uh, people. I'm sure it was people. It might, been, it might have been lab rats, actually. It might have been rats. I'm not sure, but I'll have to check. I haven't read the paper for a long time. Um, they were exposing some <laughs> either rats or humans uh, light and sound at 111 hertz and doing, I think it was people actually because they were doing MRI scans and they discovered that uh, um, there was this kind of phenomena taking place which is it's a bit of a mouthful to describe but it's, you said it really <laughs> well yeah. hemispheric Reverse, no, rever reverse la hemispheric lateral lateralization. lateralization. Exactly, that's it. And um, uh, so this is basically uh, a curious thing. So um, if you're, say, right handed and you do certain, you know, you do your right handed, you use your right hand for most things, certain cognitive tasks and ancestral tasks are kind of being controlled by the left side of your brain and, they, and it lights up and your left-handed vice versa right but when you're exposed to this frequency for some reason that flips around so it becomes it just swaps around um so which is a curious thing and i don't know they they didn't really know why it happened and it was just an observation um but just seemed interesting so they kind of were speculating whether there was like a ancient knowledge of this you know somehow or whether there was a Pathological, perhaps not pathological, because we were discussing it hasn't really been researched. You know, there's not been any further research done on the frequency, um, <clears throat> and it's been banded about as a, like a healing frequency. But there's no reason why it should be a, uh, technically a healing frequency. Perhaps it is, but it's uh, it's also speculation. Um, but nonetheless, it was it was something that I got kind of excited by, inspired by, because it's an interesting thing to kind of explore. So I started making work uh, with this frequency and kind of including it in, into sort of narratives and, and using it as a framework. Um, and, and, and basically using this frequency as, 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 a, as a way of, uh, in, in these electrical works. So when I, when I make sounds with ele uh, electricity, I'm, I'm using this frequency. Um, and this whole sort of cosmology evolved around it, um, where, uh, so there's this project, <clears throat> so what you see here is there's a, it's, it's part of a, well actually the whole show I guess is part of an ongoing project which I call a modular opera. And it's not really an opera, other than I work with musicians sometimes, and sopranos, particularly sopranos, and sometimes bassos, and bassos are interesting because of the frequency because because um it's only it's it's usually not only usually the male voice that can actually achieve 111 hertz is a very low frequency so most men can do it some men can't and and some women can do it but most women can't um but it's a very human and very normal natural frequency that we're exposed to all the time um so working with bassos and and sopranos to create these um you know, sound works, but also narratives around um, certain ideas. Now, this piece is like a, it's like a, it's a tea ceremony. So there's a, so the modular opera is actually works that just come together. So it could be, you know, any, any type of um, work, but somehow it either becomes the set or a, or an instrument or a, some kind of part participation or some kind of, seen in a, in a, in a larger um, narrative, which is kind of modular, basically. Um, but then some works, like this film installation, uh, which was made in collaboration with a filmmaker, Helga Dorothea Fannin, um, is, is very specifically drawing to this, from this narrative, which is based on, which is based on a shaman, um, and the character is made up of two shamans, one or two types of shaman, or one particular shaman who was a female shaman in um, from the Amazonian base 
Basin who was murdered by a Canadian tourist or just, you know, some, someone came to uh, this place to kind of do ayahuasca rituals and, and didn't really engage in any of the ceremonies and kind of uh, ended up murdering uh, this woman. And, uh, and the, the tribe are interesting, or the group, this, these people are interesting because they, they work with this concept of Ikaro, which is healing with sound, healing with voice. And uh, so Ikaro is both voice and image. It's a very curious thing. So there's, it's painting and voice, but somehow really interlinked, interlinked with ayahuasca and ayahuasca ceremonies. <clears throat> and um, so this person was part, makes up part of this character. And then there's another uh, type of shaman that is predominantly in Siberia who, um, who work, they work with Amanita muscaria mushrooms, the archetypal red and white mushroom, um, uh, to, do, to do ceremonies and, you know, you make a tea out of it. It's a very poisonous mushroom, but also has, uh, I wouldn't say psychedelic effects, but it's a delirium and, and has, um, has been used for thousands of years. Um, and yeah, so the stories of this, it's like a, so there's the operatic trope of the woman dies, right? So it's kind of, by not, it's not really an opera, by, but calling it an opera, it's a kind of criticism of the conventions around opera, uh, but also um, talking about, you know, other narratives where, where it's about rebirth. So there's this idea of shamanic death and rebirth, but in this, the, the, the shaman dies, but she's then reborn and comes back and uh, does certain things. And this scene, I guess this act was the tea ceremony. Um, so it's all shot with children, actually. She's it's, it's this young, uh, it's, it's the shaman as a child uh, participating in a Amita Muscara tea ceremony. Um, and then there's a sort of another room with uh, a light work similar to the one upstairs. This one is actually oscillating at 111 hertz. Uh, and you can hear the sound, which is which is throughout the space, but you have um, other sounds within the... So there's like a core uh, gong bath that I've made with uh, bespoke instruments. So, so bespoke, well, not bespoke, but very particular Tibetan gongs and uh, a bespoke shruti box from India. Um, and uh, so that permeates through the space and then... Uh, upstairs, there's some uh, very elaborate. We just, I think, we just went past them, but very elaborate um, storyboards uh, of the film, uh, which are commissioned miniature paintings uh, by a by a painter called um, Bushra uh, uh, Brishna Brishna Amin Khan mm. from Pakistan, who was uh, who studied at the NCA. Um, so I would give her descriptions of the scene, and she would she paint them, and. Um, and they're framed, or they're illuminated, let's say, in these, uh, in these very elaborate illuminations, which are made from solar cells, but they, the solar cells then also generate um, electric, oh, these are these ones. So the solar cells also generate um, electricity and create these halos over the, over the shaman character of light, which then changes throughout the day, depending on how much light the um, pieces are uh, exposed to. So there's a very there's lots of sort of theological tropes that come into mm. these works, both theological but also astro theological, which is another side of um, uh, a side of this story, I guess. Like for instance, I don't know if you can see that, but <clears throat> one of the scenes there's two scenes there's two paintings here. One is uh, the shaman is harvesting the mushrooms from the tree and then drying them in the trees. Uh, and another one is the tea ceremony where she's sat uh, watching. Uh, uh, the, well, she's there's, they're having the tea ceremony, but there's a, there's a, there's some stars in the background, and you see Orion's belt and and uh, the Sirius star, right? And there's, so there's this kind of um, story that comes from this group called the Astro Theologists. It's kind of fascinating that they always suggest that the, um, there's lots of things from various religions that come from uh, celestial objects or you know so it's the personification of celestial objects so uh, so uh, the story here is that the, the 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 three the belt of Orion's belt is known as the three wise men throughout history of the three three kings right 
and then you have uh, Sirius, which is the brightest star in the sort of east. And and then if you if you make a line from like from um, the belt down to um, Sirius and then carry that through to the horizon. That's where Virgo rises. This is all on the winter solstice, by the way, so it only happens during the winter solstice when those mushrooms are kind of had time to cure and stuff. So, yeah, so that's where Virgo rises and the sun rises. So, uh, so they think the personification here is the three wise men follow the brightest star in the east and the virgin gives birth to the sun. So, so the idea is that that's the story of the nativity, basically. Um, and sort of, but these rituals did, you know, take place or have uh, forever taken place on on the winter solstice uh, because of the seasonal aspect of the of the mushroom itself, but also also of um, also just because it's the winter solstice, it's the moment when the lighter days are coming, right? Um, so it's kind of a fascinating story, anyway. Um, so all these narratives sort of go into the opera and form this sort of um, cosmology, I guess, for these things to take place. And then at the end of the show, I don't know if it's... You um, encounter this... Um, <clears throat> you sort of went past it a minute ago, but there's this thing, which is a colony of leafcutter ants that live upstairs. So you have the gong bath... Uh, coming in, and leafcutter ants are kind of uh, all blind female ants that uh, serve one queen that lives in a nest. But they they cultivate uh, f a fungus, they cult cultivate a mushroom. So they uh, they're farmers essentially, and they take the leaves, they cut them, they take them to the um, fungus, and they grow the fungus, and they live off the fungus. And uh, so there's this ecosystem of of um, uh, leaf. Is there any other pictures of that? There's a sort of this ecosystem of ants, but it's also combined with another, so a heart, like a man-made ecosystem where there's uh, this, this uh, piezoelectric sensor, so like a vibration sensor. Um, and, and then there's solar panels. So the solar panels, I don't know if there's image. I haven't really talked about the sort of solar and ecological side of all of this yet, but... Um, oh, yeah, it's a, it's, so technically what's happening is this, the, the fungus needs between 20 and 30 degrees Celsius to survive, right? And in order to maintain that heat, there's these halogen lights that turn on and off uh, just to regulate the heat with the thermostat. But as the halogen lights turn on and off, they also illuminate solar panels, which then provides electricity for a synthesizer. The synthesizer turns on and does its thing, but as the ants walk over the sensor, they add 111 hertz into the into the sound. So they kind of basically are. It's it's like I'm collaborating. The idea is for it's an elaborate way to collaborate with the ants to make music, essentially. <laughs> but it's this kind of like, uh, um, yeah, sort of quasi man-made and quasi um, natural ecosystem that exists. I, maybe I just want to stop there because. Yeah, it's, I mean, there's so much that you've presented there that's amazing really rich and really complex and actually it kind of helps set the tone a little bit for the work that you do see at the Ashara mm. Foundation because then you see a similar kind of work here but within the context of within a constellation of so many other kinds of ideas but what I think um, it's quite interesting that you evoked I mean the technological alongside the theological and this kind of keeps cropping up, I think might be one way to begin to kind of intervene is that it seems like when you encounter a lot of your works, if you sort of break it down, you look at it in a modular way, you look at it in individual units seem quite sort of comprehensible, digestible, earthly in a way, um, quite grounded. But then you've also got that immediate kind of, you take a step back, even say at the work at Ishara, you'll see sort of, you know, there are things that you can recognize, forms that you recognize. Uh, you know, lines, lights, shapes, um, the rock. But then you take a step back and you look at that kind of wonderful pattern it makes um, on the ceiling and you, there's this whole evocation of, you know, abstract uh, notions of sort of, you know, cosmologies, like, like you said, and a far more kind of... Um, there, there's an evocation of the worldly and otherworldly at the same time that I see kind of 
uh, unifying a lot of the work. So I wonder if you want to speak a little bit to that, um, how, how those two things come across all the time. Yeah, that I guess. Balance. Yeah, I guess this. I think for me, there's always something otherworldly in everything, you know, and it's kind of about presenting how to present that, how to kind of tap into things that are kind of normal, but then actually, and that's and art's very good at doing that, right? Mm. And 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 I and I and I have this uh, sort of belief, I guess, which is informed by various scholars who, who uh, from many different disciplines, I guess, that talk about art as a diluted form of shamanism in, in sort of, and I'm talking about the Western canon here, I guess, because that's, you know, where I predominantly be situated, but then it's a Western I idea, but art has become, uh, yeah, artists and what art, art does is like a very diluted form of shamanism, which is this um, process or, or practice of trying to engage with the other and trying to do what you're, you're describing, you know, um, get something otherworldly or you know try and grasp or or see or observe something otherworldly but then try and communicate that to everyone else you know and trying to sort of say look there's something otherworldly going on everywhere but how do we then how do you then present that or how do you communicate that and learn from it and that's kind of basically what art does and i think you know and i sort of so i i, I feel like that's a really nice way of thinking about thinking about it that is it that it is ultimately a form of shamanism yeah so like artists being these people that sort of see change before change is happening that whole idea of the um what is the word like harbingers like the cassandra like someone who's able yeah, to kind of maybe yeah i don't know about yeah, i don't is, know about that i don't know if it's like prophetic but more like seeing things you know being able to see, being able to not being able to see things but kind of teasing out or tapping into mm. things but the, the i think the process is then trying to present that and communicate that. Because mm. you can't really communicate it in the end. It's not really, you know, when you have like otherworldly experiences or, you know, if somebody has like a profound experience, no matter how, you know, how much you can kind of describe it, you can never really, another person can't really have that, you know, you can't have yeah. that experience. But, that experience. But that, that's exactly, I mean, that taps in really well to another question I wanted to ask you is where does the audience then, come in because of course every person's experience is going to be mediated through their subjectivity so even the way um you know certain humans how you respond to say waves your your breathing changes when you respond mm -hmm. when you look at particular lines um each person will be looking at these images and interpreting it with their own uh, in, a, in a different way mm -hmm. so then what are those kind of micro shifts in perception or those different kinds of experiences that you're hoping to elicit in the mm -hmm. audience? Where does the audience come in to the work? Well, it's a good question. I hope that the audience are participants in the work rather than observers. You know, I kind of, before I, uh, I had this sort of, uh, I, you know, I always kind of, I, 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 my undergraduate was a painting degree. So I, you know, studied art and, you know, kind of really was interested in, but then I dipped into design for a while because I wanted, I think it was because I wanted my work to engage with everyday life you know i wanted like mm. it be part of everyday practice people be able to touch it and and, and be you know l live with it and it not just be this thing that's separated from real you know uh, everyday praxis and um but actually you know design doesn't it, it, it wasn't really the right space for it because yeah, i think maybe it's something to do with criticality because the criticality of design is always down to its use its use value um, and if it, you know, is the function, if it works or not, whereas the criticality of art is where the fact that it doesn't, it isn't useful. So you have this whole other discursive side that comes out of it. So, um, I, yeah, so I feel like, so, so that was really important to me to like, you know, how do you, how, how do people engage with this stuff? Um, but I think it's, this, you know, there's something to be said about uh, Bart and death of the author, you know, and, and just kind of, um, you know, what happens after the work is there is, is that the relationship is with the person that encounters it. It's, you know, that's, that's a, it's not really for me to decide, you know, I, you know, of course I want people to look up and maybe not, maybe not understand, you know, let's, let's say there's no, um, contextual you know there's no nothing written about the work or said about the work you know 
you see red, green, and blue light on the ground, but you look up, you see white light, and then you see these strips of red, green, and blue, you know, kind of, and that, you know, something happens there whether you're thinking about it or not. And it's the same with the sound, the sound of electricity that oh, I, I really got uh, hooked on, you know, we, there's, you, you, you know, as a, as a body in space, you somehow, your body somehow knows that you're hearing live electricity as opposed to recorded sound. It's just this kind of obvious thing. It's the same as when you're sitting in a room talking to someone or hearing a voice in the next room. You kind of know whether it's a recording or it's an actual voice. And it's not really to do with the quality of the, of the reproduction. It's, it's actually, um, there's, you kind of, you kind of know it, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, I guess we're quite sophisticated in that sense. Um, but even the not know, so even the not knowing, acknowledging as a as a sort of uh, cognitive thing, there's a definitely a. I feel like there's definitely a physiological thing that happens that we engage with, uh, which I think is yeah super yeah. I think that's like the core of it. Yeah. Yeah, it does feel like um, there's this space almost for you to have sort of very tangible things that you can hold on to and then also some there's there's a lot of room for that ambiguity which i think the human brain then holds on to and there's a kind of perceptual um almost lock i think that can happen when you're un unable to understand things um and which is i think that space in which maybe the viewer can kind of enter and um and perceive things but I, I don't know if anyone else is. In, I'm I'm always really interested in asking artists about process. Sorry, it's really boring. Um, but I'm always thinking to myself, how do you come up with actually? Um, is is your process? It seems to me when it when it comes across this sort of technological and this research based, you imagine someone sitting there and meticulously planning everything. But just having met you very very briefly, I'm also wondering if you allow room for kind of the instinctual and the improvised as well and how that kind of plays out in the making of your work yeah i'm really you know i'm really hands-on in the studio so most things you know are made in the studio obviously it's things that i can't do like make glass cubes for instance they'd have to be fabricated um but you know i i'm really there kind of developing things and making things you know i'm always electrocuting myself or things blow up I get burnt with a soldering iron quite often. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, um, yeah, it, it, I, there's definitely room for things to, you know, I might have an idea, but it's never, you know, through the process of making something, it's never what I imagined in the, you know, it had to have been when I first thought about it. You know, you almost have like an idea or a, vi a vision of something in your head. You know, you kind of picture something and you think, oh, that could be interesting, but then it never, it never really ends up. It never really ends up being like that. Um, so it's it's quite. Um, yeah, I think I yeah I'm definitely I you know the mistakes are usually great. I I kind of you know some things are just happy accidents, um, which I don't know. For instance, uh, one of the slides earlier on was a was a picture of a bulb and a radio, and there's that's another technological thing where. Um, energy saving light bulbs, CFL light bulbs, were never really exist, uh, never really designed to exist with transistor radios, because just as transistor radios were being outmoded, these new technologies of light were coming in. So, but what happens if you put them together? There's this interference sound, that there's buzzing sound, so which is which is great. But because they were never designed to coexist, they it was the the interference was never designed out of the of those things, right? So. Um, but you know, it was just by accident that I put a tr transistor radio next to a bulb and I heard this sound and I was like, great, you know, this is compositional material. And then by making loops and stuff, you start having rhythms and things. So, um, it's just, yeah, it's just being open to, uh, seeing, you know, finding these like little things and not being annoyed by them and actually embracing them and kind of going with it to kind of, yeah, elaborate. <laughs> Um, I wonder if we should bring it back slightly to the question of the of time and this exhibition. Maybe I'll just ask that and then we can open it up to the audience. But just thinking about um, different kinds of perception of time and, and the work here definitely, um, you know, as you said, it evokes the geological, the mythological 
um, I'd love to spend more time talking <laughs> about you know the wave epoch and and on all of that and the cosmic. But how do you see your work as relating to the notion of time and maybe even the time that we live in? Yeah, it's a really strange thing because you know I was studying when Fukuyama wrote the End of History and and you know Derrida and all, you know I was reading all these things that kind of really uh, deconstructing um, you know everything you know and 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 then now we sort of live in this you know post truth condition where where um it's really hard to uh situate oneself you know with with all the information that we receive especially with like ai algorithms um deep you know fakes and whatnot right so this kind of um um and and talking about our memories you know sabi mentioned earlier we were talking about memory and stuff and how that's informed by images you know our kind of our kind of um phones full of all the years of you know our past um so we have a very you know because time is you know in in physics I, I you know i did this residency at cern at a large hadron collider and you know spent a year trying to learn about particle physics just in preparation to go into a residency and then finally doing it and then you know uh diving deep into you know kind of and i you know i ended up doing it with a colleague jack jelfs who, who who studied physics um so there was like a you know <laughs> there was like a bridge to the language that's being used you know um and trying to understand um t time from a from a from a physical point of view which is which is also you know in some ways, another belief system, right? Um, Terence McKenna always says, if you give me one free miracle, we'll describe the rest, you know, we'll explain the rest. And that's, you know, that's what he says about science. Um, and uh, so there's, so thinking about, um, you know, like almost not thinking about time being an actual thing mm -hmm. is, is almost more interesting than thinking about time. Because actually when you think about time in a practical sense you know you just think about the clock you don't think about the earth rotating around the sun you know you don't think about the earth spinning or you don't think about the moon going around the earth you think about shit i'm late for whatever you know or this is like that so so it's a really sort of a constructed uh, you know and and i guess gregorian way of thinking right um but you know, but we all know from COVID, like time stretched and you know shrank, and and you know we 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 see people post and before you know the world is split into everything used to be post and pre nine eleven. Now it's <laughs> now it's post COVID, pre COVID, right? And uh, two are linked, but uh, so uh, there's a whole um, yeah. I think we think about things differently, and I think. Um, yeah, it's it's um, it's interesting to kind of situate ourselves and think about well, actually, let's forget about um, uh, certain constructs that we've built up probably since the Enlightenment, you know. And this is again Western thinking, right? Um, and and reassess the whole sort of landscape. And then, but how do we do that? How do we create? Um, mechanisms and processes and rituals and, and practices to kind of reassess things and reevaluate um where we where we stand yeah. i don't know if that answers your question or it's yeah, just no, a... <laughs> well it makes me go back and look at the work in a different way which is always a good thing um and yeah so talking about post-covid it's nice to have a gathering of people in a room and just be able to see each other face to face and and, and meet and talk so I'm, I'm going to open it up to the floor now because otherwise i said i would like to sit and talk to you about drum and bass for a while um but i don't know if anyone else wants to um, hear about dancing days in, in in england so if anyone would like to ask any questions and then we can hand i think some mics around i don't know if we need the mics actually if you if we needed the mics at all or if you can hear us probably in this room Hey, everyone. Hey. <laughs> How are you? Uh, great talk. <clears throat> I was really pleased with this uh, this new stuff on the 111 hertz and um, kind of made me think along with Joby's question about the uh, audience. And um, I wonder if it's a participant or if the audience are a kind of extension of your 
work with the sensor, right? Like, mm. this, you know, the halogen light switch, some, the synthesizer plays, right? The 111 hertz comes, the brain flips, right? There's this sort <laughs> yeah. of like, I, and I kind of, I really like the idea of thinking about your audience as actually kind of sensors or a kind of flattening between sort of your, sort of your careful attention to, to those kind of thresholds and those switches mm -hmm. and what they might also kind of, uh, engender in a kind of audience so one thing is to consider if the audience is a, a sensor mm. in your work something sensible to it and 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 sensing the excess of kind of electromagnetic uh, radiation uh, you know interference all this stuff <clears throat> and then the other is is kind of the question of the ant then right if the audience is the sensor what is the ant <laughs> and uh, that's where I'll leave oh uh, yeah yeah that's super interesting I never yeah, I mean, I kind of said it, I guess, quite flippantly, that the audience is a participant, but I guess, it's, it's, yeah, thinking about the audience as a sensor is a more nuanced and kind of more focused way to think about it. And it's, yeah, it's kind of nice, isn't it? Because then, the, the, but the thing about the sensor is, if I'm working, if I'm, you know, if I'm collaborating or, or thinking about or working with a sensor, I, there's always like this feedback and perhaps that feedback is the response and the dialogue that happens from the audience or people that, you know, see the work and observe the work. It's kind of a, it's actually a nicer way to say it, you know, so, <laughs> so I mean. Uh, but there's yeah. also no base, there's no baseline. You don't have a control for your yeah. sensor. Each sensor is not the same. So that's also quite an interesting kind of experiment to do because you don't have a control in that. If you're thinking yeah, of it, yeah, in exactly. lines of a conventional experiment. So... But Each also, sensor is a completely different... It's, yeah, it's because it's someone with their own experience and their own, you know, which you can't, you know, repeat that experience. So it's a kind of unique, yeah, it's a unique response, right? But then what does that make the ants? The ants are kind of, <laughs> yeah. Do the ants then become an audience of some kind or, a you know, like a... It's like, it's almost like social media where we become the product. You know, <laughs> like it's like a... <laughs> <strange>. <laughs> <laughs> the the sun yeah the sun yeah yeah there's a sun yeah absolutely yeah yeah there's the sun with the solar panels yeah yeah because curiously yeah because curiously in this piece there was another part of it was there's a glass facade in that room so the solar panels were responding to these lights turning on and off because of the temperature thing. But there's also the sun will just come in sometimes and it will create another layer of sound and thing that was really different, actually, for the, for the, in terms of what the synthesizer was doing. Yeah, so there's this kind of other... You know, it's... it's, it's I, you know, I, maybe whether it's... I, I definitely think this idea of the, of the sensor is a nice, you know analogy or metaphor for how to describe it but it's it's really about an ecosystem you know cre like giving giving um uh sort of trying to create an ecosystem from from nothing and then seeing what happens you know letting that ecosystem evolve into whatever it evolves into it'd be also interesting to see what happens to people because you did a 40 hertz work as well didn't yeah, you? yeah the 40 hertz and that has been kind of scientifically proven to help with various different conditions like fibromyalgia and breaking yeah. down amyloid plaques. Amyloid and plaques, yeah. These Alzheimer's, kinds of, yeah. Exactly. So yeah. That, that's Definitely. been proven. So what does the 111 frequency, what do, it does to the audience coming in would be actually quite interesting to monitor. Yeah. Like what kind of things are you getting? <laughs> well, there's that, obviously there's a lateralization reversal yeah. thing happening, right? So, but uh, what does that actually do? What's yeah. the cause and effect? You know, well, we know the cause and effect, but what's the mechanism and why, why what, what's the you know, if there's any use to it or not, we you know. need more studies done. Yeah, they need, I think, yeah, I think more we, studies. Need, <laughs> we need to find out. Does anyone else have? Yeah. I would like to, to ask your opinion on something. Uh, myself, I'm a technocrat, and I rely on the artist to help us uh, kind of understand uh, where we're heading. And you said earlier that uh, you personally feel confused about our era. Um, so I'm just wondering. I mean, if we see the old art or the Middle East, the the, mid, uh, the Renaissance art, we can see something. We can see the bright, the dark ages. Do you think if somebody sees the art of today, 
after 200 years? Do you think they will understand something or they will realize you're confused? <laughs> What's your opinion? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they'll be like, "This is they're supposed to be doing something, but we're not quite sure what." Um, <laughs> maybe there's something living in here once. Um, yeah, I don't know what would. Uh, it de it really depends, doesn't it? Because it feels like we lived in a, such a globally connected situation now, and if we survive the next 200 years, which I hope we do, um, <laughs> which I'm sure we will, um, there's enough. Uh, there's so much. Um, uh, rigor in in preserving thoughts and ideas and develop developing of things that there's enough support there to kind of keep things alive somehow. You know, even just even just social media, even just our technology. I mean, I don't personally, I don't use social media, I never have. But the fact that you can pretty much you know have a record of everything constantly everywhere at once is is kind of um, I don't think that's going anywhere, you know. It, it might change form, but that content is going to sort of exist and people can tap into it if they want. If it's relevant, if it's irrelevant, then it disappears, you know, until it becomes relevant again and then people find it or try and find it or not. <laughs> um, you must or you m might not have a belief system, a way of thinking that you are comfortable with or that helps you function. Uh, how much of your time is spent outside of that comfort zone that you can explore and come up with concepts and works and does that overwhelm you? Mm. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I have a very um, strange relationship to belief systems in the, in the sense that in, on one hand, you know, I sort of came to the conclusion a few years ago that there's there's no truth in the end we've only got our beliefs right so truth is just whatever fabrication everyone has their own perspective so everyone has their own truth right but we but what we do have is our beliefs which we can't really which we don't choose somehow it they just it just we believe, you believe something or you don't you know you believe the sky is blue or it's not right or you don't um and um but I think um, there's definitely practices and, and, and things that we do, you know, every day and rit ritualistically that um, that help us get by and, and do things and help us, you know, frame things and, and understand the world. And um, for me, like, literally working in the studio is like a meditation, you know, like when I'm in, when I'm really in the studio and in the zone and kind of doing something, usually the most mundane things, if I'm soldering a circuit board <laughs> you know that's kind of the most meditative and 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 the, the the where my mind can kind of wander into different directions and kind of be really so i feel really privileged in that sense that you know my work and my practice and my uh m you know kind of meditation and all those things are kind of one thing you know like making music i mean sitting in a room just listening to 111 hertz for a day is kind of incredible <laughs> you know it's like a, it's like a really um or 40 hertz or you know it's kind of an incredible thing uh and it does feel like a bit of a privilege but then yeah so i don't you know i don't tend to meditate i mean i, I do i do other things as well and and have and, and really into religions different religions and kind of different practices and um so it's just um yeah it's kind of it's a good question because like there's it's all kind of the same for me somehow. Is that what you're trying to ask? Like I was just trying to get inside your head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sabi, you are, Sabi, you're allowed to ask a question. <laughs> and then... <laughs> uh, thanks, Harun, and thank you, Jyoti. I wanted to actually pick up on something Harun brought up and then Tariq responded to about really, like, what is the viewer in relation to the work? And I think... It's interesting to bring up this spectrum of possible subjects from an audience to a participant mm -hmm. to a censor to, mm -hmm. um, to the sun itself being the medium, and we're all kind of subjected to it. But given there's this like close preoccupation you seem to have with um, healing, or certain kinds of frequencies, certain kinds of hertz that have this healing property, we can also think of this in relation to its exact inverse, 
where light and sound are also used as torture techniques. Um, you know, like um, forced solar gazing, um, white torture or white noise torture and all of these things. So if these were two sides of the same coin, one that induces a state of healing and the other that induces a state of complete delirium, mm. um, then actually you're inflicting your audience. And if there's a long tradition of philosophy which really contemplates what is an audience, is an audience a passive spectator, is an audience an active participant, mm. I think it brings up a very interesting question of when art inflicts. Yeah. It might be inflicting something healing, but it also might be inflicting, a painting is not inflicting necessarily on you unless it's a very, um, not, not tastefully awful, but like offensive painting. Yeah, but you painting can inflict something on you. But I think yeah. in this, it's literally inflicting. And I, why I want to bring this in is because you brought up phenomenology. And if you think about it, I mean, at least a long tradition of phenomenology would suggest that, for instance, the horizon does not exist. It is produced in the mind, in our perceptual apparatus of, you know, it doesn't actually exist in nature where the sky and the, and the waters or the earth meet. Yeah. It is produced in our minds. And so you're inducing certain perceptions. And maybe instead of being a sensor or an audience, one is a subject in the sense of being subjected to. I wonder. Yeah, no, it's, really, it's a really good question, right? Because uh, there's so many things there to unpick or kind of um, like one of the, just the, this is just a preface really. But if you're going into, a, if you're going into, if you're going to go and see a painting, you're, you're going to go to a gallery, right? You're going to visit that space to see a painting. So you're choosing to be inflicted, you know? So the, the question of infliction kind of is somehow removed. It's a choice, right? So um, unless somebody, you know, takes you, forces you to go, like I do my kids sometimes, and then they're not, well, not forced, but, you know, they're like, oh, not another gallery. Um, <laughs> another museum. Um, There's an affliction. Yeah. Is there any screens? Yeah, screens, great. Um, so, but then the, the thing that I find most fascinating um, is this thing of perception and context or um, sight and setting. It's a term from psychedelics, really, but sight and setting... Um, so for instance, white noise is a really good one. It really depends if you say, if you say to people, this is healing, then it's healing. If you say it's tor torture, then it's torture, right? So the same, th like white noise, uh, Max Newhouse, the sort of sound artist, m musician, um, designer, you know, polymath, yeah, yeah pardon? Police collaborator, yeah, exactly, the sirens. Um, he, um, he said this incredible thing about waterfalls, like people want to people wanna live by waterfalls, but they don't want to live by super highways. But from a certain distance, it sounds the same. You know, and that sound is like white noise. You know, so it's, uh, it's kind of curious that actually it's just how we perceive a certain thing, whether it's positive or negative. The word noise is... Um, is, is doesn't exist in Japanese, for instance, and it comes etymologically is linked to nuisance. The word nuisance it comes from nuisance. So we've always and it comes from the industrial revolu revolution. Before in the industrial revolution, there was no noise. It was just hi-fi. Everything was hi-fi space, right? Just the sound of nature, and then and then you have the sound of industry, which was man-made and it was kind of repetitive, and and so that's where the term noise sort of evolved and became really prolific. Um, so you, we get this kind of negative part of it, but in, in Japan, all, all no, noise, sound, like they, noise music is a thing, right? But all sounds are kind of equal somehow. Um, and, um, and there's no positive or negative to it. So that thing about infliction is, it, you, you know, you come with something, you know, so, or you, so I, you know, I often... I often thought my works, especially some of the early works, were like horrific in terms of, you know, I wouldn't have a problem with them. But as soon as I installed them, I was like, shit, the, you know, invigilators or people are going to get really annoyed with this, right? But then after a while, I started to learn that actually they, they don't. Partly because it's some, you know, most of them aren't repetitive. So there's not this repetition, uh, which has a lot to do with it. Um, 
but partly because I don't know. I think uh, if you're kind of thinking about it in the context of art, then it's very different. Um, so that's yeah. So that complicates that sort of question, I guess, for me. And then also um, th this question of healing. Now that's sort of you know a lot of that. I feel like it's mumbo jumbo. You know, there's a lot of stuff that comes. You know, there's there's science and there's history that we can look at. We can see that these there was um, these chambers, you know, there you can, Tibetan gongs have been used for many centuries, all these practices, the Ikaro practice I was talking about in the Amazon, so on and so forth. So there's obviously something to it. Science is finding things, but then there's the fodder, there's everything else. There's every other frequency in the scale of the, you know, whatever, the 20 to 20,000 hertz that we can hear that, um, and beyond and below, right? So. Uh, that people um, may sort of say that it has these properties, but you have to kind of sort of, yeah, sift your way through all this other stuff to get to the cause. And so there is, you know, there's definitely something because there is physiology that happens. And if if somebody says, you know, dropping water on your head is really horrible, then it is really horrible, you know. Um, and it's that's a that's when any and anything can be weaponized, which is kind of pretty dark, I guess. I don't know if that answers your question, but so I don't know about the infliction thing. Whether I'm yeah. <laughs> Certain frequencies have been shown to have analgesic effects and produce endorphins, and I think those things can be maybe measured. Yeah. But the rest, like you said, it's there's a lot of mumbo jumbo as well yeah. out there. But it comes back to also belief. Like, what's your expectation? What's your belief of what this is doing? Yeah. And I think that's also down to ingrained patterns of seeing and thinking, and it comes back to neural plasticity, which maybe looking at some artworks, experiencing some artworks, maybe if that can induce and make you... Produce new neural pathways at its best. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe maybe that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. New ways of seeing. Yeah, I've just invented something. <laughs> um, that's what you want from. Just talking. That's what sure. you want from a talk. Uh, pseudoscience. Um, thank you all for <laughs> everyone uh, for 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 coming this evening. I think that's pretty much time in the interest of time. Um, <laughs> Thank you for being here, and uh, thank you for, no, thank for you. you know, lovely yeah, to lovely, meet you, yeah, and lovely, lovely to talk about yeah. your conversation, uh, your, yeah. your work. So thank you. Thank you, Harun. Really, thank you very much. And Jyoti, very elegantly moderated, very thoughtful. This could go on for a couple of hours, and yeah, yeah. Harun's here for the rest of tonight. I mean, in Dubai, so you can catch him. We're not going to moderate that. <laughs> so so he, he's around, and, and the exhibition's on for another week, so I hope you get to see it. Reach out to us if you want a tour of the show, if you want to see his work, and get to see what, what exactly is going on. So thank you all really very much, and we'll keep you posted of what's next. Have a nice evening. Thank you.